Today, the Islamic world is still full of shit. Alright guys, we're standing at a shit pond. Apus in here is gonna jump into it. Get it. Apus. Oh shit. Oh no. Hey, oh, what the fuck? Sick. Oh shit. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone Welcome back to another episode of the Islamic Chronic Podcast So today we are reacting to 17th reason as to why uh, Boston Prophet left Islam 17. The lack of progress in the Islamic world as always The Islamic world as we hear so often was once full of prosperity and science well, it wasn't. It was just a phase where people who were not so much concerned about religion, but rather about science and and, and, and intelligence and wisdom and philosophy, uh, contributed in a great way to society. Here he's committing the burden of proof fallacy. I mean, how on earth does he know that <laughs> Muslims in the uh, golden age of Islam were not interested in religion? Like, where does he get that data from? Like, he's just assuming it without any evidence, without any arguments whatsoever. How do we know if someone is religious or not, right? Well, well, obviously, we cannot see what is in, inside their heart. So all we can do is observe that outside behavior, okay? So what were the outside behavior of Muslims at that time? Well, they lived under a caliphate. They, you know, observed Sharia law. And the, their whole life pretty much was covered under the rulings of Islam, okay? So how can anyone in their right mind say that, you know, these people were not religious? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, they literally lived under Sharia law, you know, the same law that you hate, Rivan, okay? You guys hate. <laughs> I mean, they were practicing the same laws that talks about, you know, chopping off the hands of thieves, the same laws that says that, you know, uh, apostates should be punished or blasphemy should be uh, punished, right? I mean, you guys are the ones who criticize us for these laws, and these people practice these laws, and you're saying that they are not religious? <laughs> so this is funny, by the way. So they have this inconsistency, right? This fallacy of inconsistency. If something like ISIS practice this Sharia law, they say that they are the true Muslim, they are following what the Prophet did, right? But when the Muslims in Andalusia or Spain who were extremely advanced and rich and, you know, prosperous, when they practice these same laws, they say, ah, but they are not religious. <laughs> it's, it, how is this consistent, right? So some of the most prominent uh, scientists were actually Islamic scholars. So saying that they didn't care about religion is like saying Neil deGrasse Tyson doesn't care about science. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. I mean, they're literally studying Islam and they're literally uh, working as a judge to uh, practice Sharia law. How can you say they don't take their religion seriously? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, for example, there is Ibn al-Nafis. Now, Ibn al-Nafis was an Arab polymath whose area of work included medicine, surgery, uh, Physiology, anatomy, biology, Islamic studies, jurisprudence, and philosophy. Now, he is known for being the first to describe the preliminary circulation of blood. The work of Ibn al Nafis regarding the right sided preliminary circulation predates the later work uh, from 1628 of William Harvey's De Amotu Cordis. Both theories attempt to explain circulation. Second century Greek physician Galen's theory about the physiology of the circulation system remained unchallenged until the work of Ibn al Nafis, for which he has been described as the father of circulatory uh, physiology. Now, another paper published in PubMed it says, apart from medicine, Ibn al Nafis studied jurisprudence, literature, and theology. He was an expert on the Shafi school of thought, uh, Shafi school of jurisprudence, and an expert physician. So he's a, both an Islamic scholar and a physician. As a matter of fact, and I, and I found this funny because I just read about it. So apparently he was also considered as the first science fiction writer. <laughs> so he uh, so apparently he wrote a book called The Treatise of Kamil 
on the Prophet's uh, biography that is con actually considered the first prototypical science fiction novel. <laughs> so, so you know, all you Attack on Titan fans and all you Star Wars fans can thank him <laughs> for getting the ball rolling regarding science fiction. There are many uh, other scientists from that period who was also Islamic scholars, for example, even Hazm, who was a polymath and historian. He also wrote books on medicine. We have Abu Hanifa bin Wadi, who was another uh, Islamic scholar. He is famous for his books on plants. He also wrote commentary on the Quran. Al Biruni, who was also an Islamic scholar and a mathematician. So, based on these uh, evidences and the fact that Muslims at the time practiced Sharia law, let me make this argument, right? Premise one <clears throat> If Muslims in the Golden Age practiced Sharia law and studied Islam, then it would prove Rifa's theory about them not caring about religion as false. Premise two <clears throat> Muslims did practice Sharia law and studied Islam. Therefore, Rigon's theory about them not caring about religion is false. What's funny is that it's never mentioned that very respected people, that very respected religious authorities, very often shunned and condemned those people and wrote letters to or about those people in which they condemned them. Well, um, the Islamic world made a lot of progress, but no thanks to Islam. <laughs> Islam had absolutely no influence in this. On the opposite, when Islam became more and more authoritarian and more dominant over them, every kind of progress fell apart. So, the thing is that Islam definitely played a huge role uh, during this period. And also, like, this is just such common sense, right? I mean, like, how do you think a bunch of Bedouins went from, you know, being a bunch of Bedouins to being one of the most major powers in the entire world? Okay, and they continue to become more and more powerful. <laughs> How do you think that happens? That happens because they found, you know, this beautiful religion that united everyone despite their differences, and they worked together. They worked together, and and they were still infighting, but that infighting was overlooked for a long period of time because of this religious unity. Okay, this is one of the main reason and one of the biggest reason why Muslims became so strong, so powerful. Now, the thing is that Islam inspires helping others, and the best way to do that is through education and learning. Uh, for example, there's a hadith by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says the following. Salam everyone. I originally wanted to quote a hadith, but I think this Quran verse makes my point much more clear. In chapter 5 verse 2 of the Quran, Allah Almighty says, O you who have believed, and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Imam Qurtubi in explaining this verse said the Almighty is saying, and cooperate in righteousness and piety that is, let one of you help one another, urge you to do what God Almighty has commanded, and act upon it, and refrain from what God has forbidden and abstain from. So righteousness here means we have to cooperate with each other, in doing good or halal things. One of the best ways to do this is to make sure Muslims can have stable and halal jobs. The best way we can have jobs is to have a good economy. The best way to have a good economy is to have a good education system. Which means learning science and technology so we can invent new things and make more jobs available for others. This is how Islam inspires education and learning and this is how Islam paved the way for the golden age. Yeah, so <clears throat> based on this uh, we can make a formal a kind of argument which goes uh, in this way. Which is, Premise one, uh, one of the best ways to give respite or someone to someone in difficulty is to give him a job. Uh, premise two, best way to make jobs available is to have a good economy. And best way to have good economy is to have good education system. Conclusion, therefore, to properly follow the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, and to make sure that we make this easy for other people, we must have a good education system. Therefore, to properly follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, we must have a good education system where we learn and teach others about Islam, science, medicine, history, etc. Right? Because, think about it, right? Uh, what is the best way you can help someone in difficulty, right? Or what is the best way you can ease someone's uh, difficulty? Uh, because we, we know about charity, but what is the best way? The best way is, is to give him a job. Right, that is the best way, <laughs> and that is the best way you can make things easy for someone. And the best way you can give job is if you have a lot of money or if you have a good business, right? And so, 
you have to have good business or good economy, you need to learn. You need to know, you need to invent things. And as you invent the new things, it creates more jobs. And as it creates more jobs, it creates, uh, it makes this easier for the people, right? So, because of this, if you want to follow the Sunnah, we have to have a good education system, right? We need to learn. We have to learn uh, to follow the Sunnah properly, right? And so, yeah, and this is exactly what the Muslims in the Golden Age did. They invested a lot of money on education, and because they have obligation to uh, obligation to reduce poverty and help other Muslims. For example, Hugh, uh, Hugh Kennedy, a professor of Arabic at SOAS University of at London, and other in a podcast said the following: The Islamic Empire heavily patronized scholars. The money spent on the translation movement for some translations is estimated to be equivalent to about twice the annual research budget of the United Kingdom's Medical Research Council. The best scholars and notable translators, such as Hunayn Ibn Pishak, had salaries that are estimated to be equal equivalent of professional athletes today. <laughs> so some of the scholars were actually literally getting paid the same amount as some of the professional athletes nowadays. Which is a lot, right? So, based on this, I think we can make a very good argument. Is that premise one? If Islam promotes education, then Islam very likely played a role in the scientific progress of the golden age. Premise two: Islam does promote education. Conclusion: Therefore, Islam very likely played a role in the scientific progress of the golden age, right? Now, if someone wants to disprove this, then they have to bring evidence that you know Islam had literally nothing to do with their education system, right? Now, another thing I wanted to touch upon, which is that he talks about you know how uh, Muslims were you know arguing against each other, etc., etc. I mean, like yeah, but scientists do that all the time, right? I mean, even now there are scientists on YouTube who are criticizing the multiverse theory and saying that it's just bogus. Then you have scientists on YouTube who said, no, multiverse theory is real. <laughs> it's a tangible scientific theory. So, you know, even now scientists fight. So, like, scientists and academics fight. So, like, why is that, like, special for Islam, right? So here, he's just commenting special pretty cards. And look how they still are. Most of them took sciences and architecture from places that they already conquered, like the Ottoman Empire, for example. The Ottomans, before they captured all those Greek places in Anatolia and in Constantinople, they were nomads, but they took everything useful from the Greeks. Yeah, so what? <laughs> Why is that like a minus point? I mean, do you think the Greeks just all of a sudden, you know, had this burst of energy of that that this burst of knowledge that just came from the sky? No, the Greeks conquered other people. <laughs> okay, the Greeks conquered Persia, they took knowledge from there. The Persians conquered other people, they took knowledge from there. Okay, this is how it works. Okay, this, this is not rocket science, Islam. This is how empires work. One empire conquers another empire, they get knowledge from that empire, and another empire comes and uh, conquers that empire, then they get knowledge from that empire. This is how it works. Islam is not special here. <laughs> this is how it works. Again, here he's committing the special political fallacy. He's making a special case for Islam without and completely ignoring all the other empires that all did the same thing. Today, the Islamic world is still full of shit. Um, if you bring this up, some people come with things like, well, um, if we would let them in peace and, you know, we always invade them and we always invaded them. And, you know, what about the Crusades? <laughs> the majority of Muslim countries today were not invaded in any way in the last hundred years or more. But you see how they are. And many predominantly Muslim countries were even made by or with the help of Western country. So yeah, this is like a non secular fallacy. I mean, even if this is true and Muslim countries are not doing well in terms of like economy and GDP and stuff like that, it still doesn't mean that Islam isn't true. <laughs> I mean, China is doing very well in terms of its economy. Does that mean that every Chinese belief or superstition that they believe over there is true? I mean, why not, right? I mean, if this is the case that when a country does well uh, in GDP, 
and that means their uh, belief, their religious belief or supernatural beliefs are true, right? Then does that mean that whatever Chinese people believe in terms of supernatural is also true? Or should I call su a superstition is also true? For example, uh, there are a bunch of Chinese superstition that you should accept now, Ritwan, because this is your argument. <laughs> For example, you can't clip uh, nails at night because Chinese people believe that if you clip nails at night, apparently that brings ghosts. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right, Ritwan. Be careful. Do not clip your nails at night. You know, For example, or what about the superstition, Chinese superstition, which says that pointing fingers at the moon will get your ears chopped off. Yes, don't do it. <laughs> Never uh, you know, point your fingers at the moon. This is a non secular fallacy. I mean, just because <clears throat> a country is doing well in terms of its GDP does not mean that somehow validates the religious belief that those people have. Okay? Same way, just because a country is doing poorly in terms of its uh, GDP does not mean the religion that, valid that invalidates the religious belief belief of those people okay the religious belief whether if the religious belief is true or false has nothing to do with the country's gdp or economy okay because in islam another thing that we believe is that allah sent or send us to earth to test us right we're not here to get any kind of worldly pleasure life will be difficult it's one of the teachings of islam okay it's not gonna be easy but if you work hard then allah will reward us right that's the whole point also another thing is that well, what about Indonesia, right? I mean, if you look at the top 15 uh, high countries with the highest GDP, Indonesia has actually been improving a lot and they have gotten into it at number 15, right? I mean, if we go by your logic, then doesn't that mean that Islam is true? Because Indonesia is the largest Muslim-majority country. <laughs> so, doesn't that prove by default that Islam is true then, according to your logic? So, yeah, I mean, like, this is just a nonsense, stupid argument. It's a non sequitur. Also, I mean, like, what do you mean by progress? Because the thing is that in Islam, we don't believe in these kind of like materialistic ideas where you just earn money and that means progress. No. For us, progress means, you know, things like pleasing Allah. That is progress for us. For example, if a country, the more religious a country is, the better that country is, okay? Uh, for example, if you give more charity, then that is far better than you earning more money, okay? For example, Indonesia is the largest Muslim majority country and it has become the number one when it, in the most charitable country in the world. So why don't they associate this with uh, Islam? I mean, why is it that always negative things are associated with Islam? Again, this is not consistent. If you guys like the video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and share the video. And if you want to support the channel, then please consider becoming a Patreon or become a member. Uh, that way I can buy an actual mic and maybe you guys won't have to hear this non, uh, this fan noise anymore. So yeah, uh, thank you guys for watching. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.